your mercy, Father. Lord, we thank you for your grace, Father. Lord, we thank you for your presence inside of this house today, Father. Lord, I pray that as we go through today, Father, Lord, you just said all the things that we walked in with. Lord, I pray that you just set them aside, Father. Lord, with the problems that we are, we are already facing today, Father, let us set them aside so that we can hear your word today, Father. Lord, I pray that you set my agenda aside, Father, that your agenda would come forth, Father. Lord, that your word would come out, Father. Lord, I pray for a fresh anointing over me, and I pray for a fresh anointing over this house today. And Lord, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in your precious and your holy name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. I just want to, as we, as we get started, I just want to thank you for having me here today. Because the, the gospel is one of those things that, that, that needs to go out into the world. Sometimes something has to be said that, 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 that unfortunately pastors are, are and there's nothing against Pastor Hartley. I'm, I'm, let me, let me, let me pre-resic with that. There's other pastors that they will not speak the truth inside of pulpits. They will not speak the truth inside of pulpits. And I'm in a, my ministry has taken a turn and I speak a lot of truth in the gospel now. And I speak a lot of truth over our nation now because that's what we need in this time. Because the, the times that we're living in, there is a falling away of the saints. But the Bible tells me that in the last days, not only is there going to be a falling away of the saints, but there is going to be revival in the land. Hallelujah. And I claim that over, over the United States right now. I claim that over Broken Bow right now. I claim that over the state of Oklahoma right now. And I claim that over our nation daily. Because that is what we need. We need revival inside of our land. We need revival, more importantly, inside of our hearts and inside of us, the church. Because the building is not the church. We are the church. We are the temple of God. Yes. Hallelujah. I might get started preaching before I even start reading my scriptures this morning. I, uh, as Brother Hartley said, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting. He called me Campbell because we do have Campbells in the ministry inside of my family. They may be Baptist, but we're all going to heaven anyways. Amen. So it, it, it is one of those things. I have pastors that I grew up Baptist. Uh, don't hold it against me, but I grew up Baptist. My dad was an uh, independent Baptist preacher. My aunt and uncles are independent Baptist preachers. We were independent Southern Baptists. We were, we were uh, fundamental Baptists. We was all the different Baptists growing up. But then uh, I remember there was one camp meet, or one one revival one time at my mother's church. She married a guy named Tommy Yon, and uh, he was Church of God. And she pulled me into this revival and convinced me to go. And I remember that, that that preacher, I still do not remember his name, but I remember that altar call. I cannot tell you what he preached on, but I remember that altar call. Amen. And I remember I was sitting right on the end aisle and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit started moving and that Baptist denomination inside of me started stirring and I got up to run out the door like I'd always done before and I remember my mom grabbed me by the arm and she pulled me up to the front of the church and that man just walked by. He didn't say a word to me. He just went boop and I went out and I've been Pentecostal ever since. So he, did, he knocked the Pentecostal into me. I don't know his name. But uh, I, have, I have a lot of respect for that man. But it's, it's one of those things that whenever we are in church, we need to get past the denominationalism. Because denomination is doing nothing but hurting people. I love the church of God. I respect the church of God. I love Baptist people. I love Methodist people. We're called to love, amen? But if we take and we put our own spin on it, then there's a problem, amen? 
So I just got, I'm I'm looking as I as I was really praying over this message and over this the the set we're in. It's kind of amazing that my that my sister was talking about Noah's Ark this morning. I'm not Noah's Ark, but I'm something along the similar lines about about God's love and God's grace for people as He's doing destruction or He's planning destruction. But I'm looking at Jonah today. And every time we think of Jonah and every time we think of Nineveh, we always think about the first two chapters, how, how, how he is called and he, he goes on a run and then he gets swallowed by a big fish and then everything's hunky-dory. And everybody always goes to those first two chapters, but there's a lot more inside of Jonah than just the first two chapters. Because if it was just the first two chapters, we would be in trouble, amen? And so we're going to be today in uh, Jonah chapter 3. And this is the, what, what the word of the Lord says. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Everybody say the second time. <laughs> Saying, arise, go to Nineveh that great city and preach it, the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Noah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from the throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth. Everybody say, he covered himself with sackcloth. <laughs> and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil ways, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. And he did do, did not do it. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that this word would penetrate our heart today, Father. Lord, I pray that you would just prepare our hearts right now for the word that you have to go forth, Father. Anoint the word, Lord, like only you can do in your precious and your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing that I want to pull out of this scripture is in the, in the scripture, in the first three verses, it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. A second time. All too often inside of our lives, how many of us are human? I know I am. How many of us has failed? How many of us has failed God? Amen. Not all of us can be like Paul to where we, we're walking down the road, God blinds us, and next thing you know, we're out there, we're out destroying the world for Christ. Not everybody has that, that, that first calling anointing. Amen. But here's Jonah. He had been called the first time and he faltered. He failed. I know I faltered and I failed. I was called into the ministry.
ministering when I was 16 years old at youth camp. I served a career in the military, retired from the military, before I came into my calling into the ministry. I ran for 20 years, ultimately. A little over 20 years. But God is not done with us. No matter how far we think we've gone, no matter how far we think that we've made it past everything and how what we've done to hurt him, his love is still upon us to the fact that he is ready to call us and take us to that next level. Amen. He is ready to continue to work. It doesn't matter that we failed. It doesn't matter that we failed last night. It doesn't matter that we failed this morning. It doesn't matter that all of those things. It matters that he loves us. He cares for us so much that we, he is the God of second chances. He is the God of third chances. He is the God of fourth chances. He is so loving that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Amen? He loved us that much. Jonah was still called. He was still called to do what, what he was called to do. Oftentimes, people get to the point to where we get, we, we get scared of the calling that God placed on us. And we don't think that we're worthy of the calling that God has given us. We don't think we're able to do the calling that God gave us. Not everybody is called to be a minister of the gospel. Not everybody is called to be an evangelist. Not everybody is called to be a prophet. Some are called to be teachers. But all of us are called to be the light of the world to a lost and dying world. Amen. And that's what we should be longing to be, is that light of the world. And not every one of us is going to make it right every single moment of our life. But that is what his grace is about. That he loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. That while we were not, a, or we were not worthy, he was. Amen. And it goes on to say, go to that great city of Nineveh and, come, and proclaim to it a message I gave you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a large city and it took three days to go through it. Where, where he started and where Nineveh was in chapter 1 and 2 Everybody looks at all of these things that, that, that we say, and, and I'll just kind of give an example. One of, the, one of my real good pastor friends, and I've, I've just met him in the last two months, and I mean, he's just, a, he's, a, he's an ambassador for, for Christ, but he was in, in uh, Israel the last two weeks, and he did this video of standing on top of the mountain where David and all of the, the troops were for David and Goliath. And he filmed this, this video of how you had to go down this huge mountain into this valley, and then there was another large area way away where the Philistines were. And I always looked at it like, okay, David and his troops were here, the Philistines were right on the other side of the glass doors in the parking lot. And it wasn't the case. It was a journey between them. Goliath had to truly yell. But we always read this and we put our own spin and our own mind inside of it. But last night, whenever I got to, to uh, Pastor Hartley's house, he was sitting there and he was watching the, the Alabama game. Amen. And it, it made me think about one of my illustrations today because it, it's kind of ironic the distance between where Jonah started and where Nineveh was would be a distance from Alabama to Dallas.
Dallas, Texas. Amen. That's about the distance that, that, that Jonah had to travel. That's putting it into a sense that we can understand. That's about what 500 miles looks like. But we, Jonah was called and he didn't want to go, but God gave him that second chance to, to allow him to go. And sometimes God is calling us to do something. We're not wanting to do it. Or we try stepping forward and, and we don't feel that right thing at that right moment. And so we start backing up. But it's time that we as Christians start stepping forward and stop spinning our wheels. It's time that we step forward into the anointing that God's given us. It's time we step forward into, into the calling that God's given us. It's time to step forward in talking to the people that we need to talk to. And stop washing everything under the table. Because right now, that's exactly what's happening inside of our nation. We're washing everything under, under the table. We're watching politics determine what we're doing. I'm starting to get ahead of myself now. But, it's a, but we're watching them do things to, in, inside of our nation that makes no sense. But it's time that we start, we start stepping into a fresh anointing. Stepping, and here's something that God laid on me whenever we were doing, whenever I was preparing. Stepping in a fresh anointing is better than laying down in freshly washed sheets. How many of you love on laundry day that you just take those sheets, you, let, you put them in bed, and whenever you get in bed that night, man, that smell is just amazing, isn't it? That is what walking inside of a fresh anointing is like. Because you are resting in Him. You are doing what He has called you to do. And you are loving every minute of it. There is nothing like that. And it still doesn't compare to walking in a fresh anointing. Am I, am I right, Sister Joanne? Because a fresh anointing, he does stuff that we don't even understand. We can't even fathom what's, what's going on. It continues on that, that, that we're, after he is still called, in verse 4 and 5, he starts getting an anointed boldness. And his boldness was not on him. His boldness was all through Christ. Jonah walked into Nineveh not wanting them to be delivered. But he had nine words that he said. He had nine words that he said. And he said this, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Eight words. That's all he said. He didn't want to see Nineveh lifted up. He didn't want to see Nineveh done right. But whenever, and here's the thing, whenever the Lord speaks a word through you, whether it, whatever way you want it to go, the Lord is going to use it for his glory. So we need to stop thinking about what we're going to say and just say what the Lord tells us to say. We need to lift up the word that the Lord's given us. We need to change our hearts. We need to change our minds. Amen. It's time we, we get outside of the box, pull the Holy Spirit outside of the box, and say, you know what? I'm not going to conform you no more to what other people think. I'm not going to conform you to the way it used to be. I'm not going to conform you to the way people say it is. I'm going to conform.
transform you to the way you want to be. Amen? Because all too often inside of our services, we have an order of service and it has to be done this way. It's the way it's always been done. But the Holy Spirit does not want to be put in the box. He does not want to be conformed to a box. And unfortunately, inside of Christianity, inside of churches today, that's exactly what they do. People walk in the door, they feel the Holy Spirit, and then they walk out the door and leave the Holy Spirit inside of the church. The thing is, is the, the Holy Spirit should be outside in the world with you no matter where you go, no matter how you do, no matter what you say, and no matter who you, get, who you confront. Amen? I'm friends with, I use a lot of people in the congregation that I know, just so you know. You, if, if I know you, you might get called out today. Uh, but Sister Renee, if you go onto her Facebook, there is always something encouraging and something uplifting. There is always something that people know that she is the light of Christ inside of her life. Amen? Amen? That's the way we should be. It should not be about chastising. It should not be about telling people how wrong they were. It should be about the love of God that's, that's being put out towards them. That they want to see there's something different about, about them than, it's, than about me. What do I need to do to find that? That's what the light of God is inside of us. It should be a beacon to pull people in. On a foggy night at the sea, there's always this, this huge light tower, lighthouse, that spins and tells ship how far the ground is so that they know they're not going to run aground. We should have that light built inside of us so that when the enemy comes, we have a foreknowledge of what we need to do. Amen? But he had a, Jonah had a simple, or God had a simple message from a simple-minded man that changed Nineveh for years. It doesn't matter what we think we're saying. It matters what God is saying through us. And that's where it matters. Nineveh was a wicked city. They had a lot of stuff going on. And in all actuality, when you look at, the, at what Nineveh was dealing with, it's half of what we're dealing with inside of the U.S. today. It's half of it. We have a lot of stuff that we're dealing with inside of our nation. But, the, but whenever we speak inside of him, whenever we take the boldness of the anointing that God gives us, it's an anointed boldness that will produce results only with faithful obedience. We can have a boldness of ourself that ain't going to do anything. We can have an anointed boldness through Him that if we restrict it and we don't walk forward in obedience, it's going to fall flat. But it's when we have an anointed boldness with a faithful obedience that the, the revival is going to happen inside of our lives, inside of our churches, and inside of our houses. And that's what we should be longing for. That's what we should be pressing forward to. Is an anointed boldness. He goes on 
and, and here's where we're going to spend a little bit of time. Here's where I'm going to get in trouble, Pastor Hartley. I'm just going to warn you now. You can always duck behind that pulpit. <laughs> there was favor from leaders. There was favor from the leaders. Here's a king that wanted nothing to do with it. But the word of the Lord hit him and he changed. His heart and his mind changed. The thing that, that, that we look at is God had planned to destroy Nineveh when Jonah went in 16 or 760 BC. Because of the change in the king's heart and the people's heart, the fact that they took and they shed their clothes and put on sackcloth and went into a fast, the destruction of Nineveh did not happen until 612 B.C. If my math serves me right, that's well over 100 years. There's an ancient anointing that we have as a, a Christian faith that can change the world. Because it's not through us, it's not through other people, it's through the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. <laughs> My wife and I recently had our, our curve painted in front of the house. Everybody puts those little numbers on their, on their driveways to say where you live. And whenever we were doing that I was looking at all her little things that she could put on there for crosses and, and all of this stuff and, and at the Air Force emblem and just do all the different things and she pulls out this one picture and she said you want Trump's face on your curb? No, I don't want Trump's face on my curb <laughs> Right now, in our country, you're in a lot of it, and I'm not saying it's you. I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at any, any of you. But the, the people outside these walls are either worshiping Trump or they're worshiping Biden. But can I tell you something? It's not about what Trump can do. It's not about what Biden can do. It's about what the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can do. We put too much faith inside of politics, but the thing is, no politicians, no matter what you think, is going to save us. From the, from the hell that is coming on this earth right now. Not a single one of them. All of them are going to do good. And guess what? All of them are going to do bad. No matter what happens, my Bible tells me that there are good leaders and there are bad leaders. But the one thing it tells me is God uses every one of them. Amen? Amen. And we have got to stop worshiping the politics. We need to stop worshiping the politicians. And we need to do what, what, uh, what the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy. And we need to pray for them. We need to lift them up. We need to stop bad-mouthing. And we need to start lifting up for God to change their hearts. Our nation is so wicked and crooked right now. I've been, I guess I've been out of the loop for a little while. I was on fire whenever I was, I was driving in yesterday. I stopped at a gas station to get me a drink and some candy. And as I was sitting there, I had no clue that this happened. This was over a year ago. But there was a sign on the register that said, effective now in order to buy tobacco you have to be 21 years old i'm not condemning or not 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 saying it's good 
or bad, which tobacco use is bad, the Bible tells us that, that we should not put anything harmful in our bodies. I will stand beside that. But here, here is a set that came to my mind. We're living in a country to where a 20-year-old cannot smoke a cigarette, but he can serve in our military and at six years old can determine what sex he is. Lord have us, Jesus. It makes no sense whatsoever. We are so backwards right now that we don't know which way's up and which way's down. We need to get to the point to where we get on our knees daily and pray for our country. And not just say that we're doing it. Because all too often people say they are, but how often are they actually doing it? It is time that we stop just praying over our dinner and start praying over our families. It's time that we just stop praying for our dinner and start praying over our church. It's time that we just stop praying for our dinner and pray over our pastor. It is time for us to be a praying generation. It is a, that is the only way that we are going to change the world. That is the only way that Christ is going to have his way. He wants to redeem us. I'm glad we're not living in the days of Noah, that it's just Noah that found grace in the eyes of the Lord, because we would all be doomed. But my Bible also tells me that in these last days, as we're, as we're needing to pray over our leaders, That there are going to be those that are preaching a message for itchy ears. I believe, as, as my brother was saying a little while ago, as Pastor was saying a little while ago, whenever the rapture happens, and this hurts my heart to say it, but I believe it with all my heart. I believe that there's churches that ain't going to skip a beat. From the pastor to the deacon to the altar boy. Because they're living a life of God as a genie in a bottle. And that's not what God is. He's not just here to bless us. The Bible doesn't say that once we get saved, that everything's going to be hunky-dory. No matter what people will tell you, it's not going to be. If, it, if you know me and you know my family at all, you know my wife battles medically daily. All the time. But it's those testimonies that's going to set the difference. We're believing right now that, that, that there's a healing coming. We're believing in, in a diagnosis that, that, that a doctor gave her last week that all of her stuff can be treated naturally, not through pharmaceuticals. Amen. I don't know about you, but that makes me happy. We have got to put him inside of his place. We need to stop putting him inside of a box. We need to allow him out inside of everything that we do. Sometimes it gets hard to stand up for Christ. But can I tell you one thing? Being a keyboard warrior on Facebook is going to do you nothing. 
People think that there's a boldness inside of it. There's not. All it does is create division inside of our world. All it does is create division. He did not come. Actually, he says that he's going to bring division. But he says when he brings division, it's going to be because the word of God is being fulfilled. And I'm ready for that division to come through in, a, in his holiness and nothing else. Because it's his holiness that sets the, sets the example. But David, pray, or Jonah prayed that one simple message of the simple-minded, and it changed the world. It changed the heart of a king, not by Jonah's ability, but by God's ability. We look at Moses. He had a stuttering problem. God said, I'll, I'll, I'll let your brother go help you. We're going to get this message out. We're going to get this message out wherever it needs to be. Because I want to save the Israelites. I want to pull them out of bondage. But it takes walking forward. Sometimes in second chances to get there. Because we're too hard-headed to do the first time. Luke 6, 27 and 28 says this, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Does it say anywhere in there that we need to surround ourselves in them? Nope. It says that we need to pray for them. We need to watch what we're doing. We did it right now. These little inventions my phone's down there. I, I turned my phone on airplane mode during church and just set it down on the, on the seat because I don't want any interruptions. But imagine this is a phone. It's an iPad, but it's a phone. This is the best invention for Christianity and the worst invention for Christianity. We can use these things to our advantage, or we can use them for our hurt. It used to be years ago, you would have to walk into a store, walk up to the counter, and ask for a magazine that was behind there with black strips across it. Now, all you got to do, unfortunately, is type one word. And everything's at our beck and call. But on the flip side, you can have an app on here that's called the BLB. If you don't know what that is, it's a great thing. It's called a Blue Letter Bible. Sister Joanne probably knows all about a blue letter Bible, amen? But you can put a blue letter Bible on there. Then you click on a verse and it breaks, breaks it up in Hebrew. It breaks it up in Greek. It breaks it up in all these different languages so you can truly see what the Word of God is saying. But you have got to have discipline to use these devices the way that God intended them. Because my Bible tells me that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he came to give us life and give it what? More abundantly. Amen. So we can either believe the lies of the devil or we can stand in faith in the promises of God. 
But ultimately, that's our choice. That's the choices that we have to make inside of these times. That's the choices that we have to do. And in the end, as we get down to the, to the last couple verses, faith overcomes doubt. Their faith, the faith of the king, overcome the doubt. In verse 9, the king said this. There was doubt inside of him. He said, who knows? Who knows? We always read it as, who knows? But who knows? Add a question mark. He was asking a question. God may yet relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Sometimes we have questions inside of our mouths. We have questions about what God's going to do. But when we put our faith over top of our doubt, then there's nothing to hold us back. There's nothing to hold us down. There's nothing to hold us back anymore. I came this morning to tell you He's not done with us. It doesn't matter if you're the youngest person inside of here or the oldest person inside of here. He is not done with you yet. As long as there is breath inside of these lungs, I'm going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. As long as there's breath inside of these lungs, I'm going to proclaim him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. As long as there is breath inside of me, I'm going to proclaim him as the light of the world. Because our world needs it right now. It's time we get up. It's time we set aside all of our doubt. It's time that we set aside all of the things that, that, that God is telling us that we're not good enough for. And it's time to start proclaiming him as Lord of Lords. It's time to, to sit down, turn off the news, and open the word of God. That news is going to do nothing but bring you down. Whether you're watching stock market or whether you're watching regular TV, it's going to do nothing but bring you down. I'm going to go ahead and do it. How many of you are all you fans? There's a few. That brought you down last night, didn't it? That brought you down last night. Right now, we're living in a world where last night there was thousands of people, actually probably millions of people in stadiums yesterday rooting and cheering and carry on on for college football teams. But on Sunday morning, they come into the church and if you raise a hallelujah, people look at you funny. We should be shouting it from the housetops. We should be shouting it from the rooftops. We should be like Daniel and opening the windows and praying no matter what people say, no matter what people think. Just put it out there. To be the light of the world. If I could get someone to come up and play the piano as I try to land this bird. But it's time that we change.
I say to you that I have walked in this place today. I have called you to be the chosen. I have called you to walk where sometimes you don't think you're able. But I am faithful. I am just. I am here for you. I have left every left the 99 to come to you and pull you to the place that you desire to be. I have called you to be the light. I have called you to stand in darkness. I have called you to be the one that I choose you to be. Stop speaking your words and start speaking mine. Say it the Lord, I feel your presence in this place right now. If you can, just stand. Right there, that if we could break into it, we could 
see things that we never thought possible. I feel him this morning. I don't know if you do. There's, a, there's something about to happen. I'm, I'm normally one that's all over the place. Pa Pastor Hartley has me, has me restricted because there's a huge step down here. Luckily, I have long legs. Because I might end up running up and down here shortly. He is ready to break things. 